This is Peggy. I was fortunate to meet Peggy when she was 35 years old. But at that point, Peggy had already traveled a long road. Some would say that Peggy and her family had been on an odyssey as they were trying to find answers for her and the entire family. So let me tell you a little bit about Peggy and her story. Peggy was born in 1978 as the first child to her parents who had just gotten married about 14 months prior. She was born following an uncomplicated pregnancy and delivery. And Peggy was welcomed with love, joy, and happiness. But Peggy was born during very difficult times, right at the height of the Lebanese Civil War. Bombs were falling, the war was raging, and right at the time of her delivery, there was an electricity cut and there was no power in the hospital. For years, her mother would wonder if that power outage had anything to do with the developmental and medical problems that soon would become evident. Peggy was an infant who rarely smiled. Only when she was tickled or when her mom would hold her face really close to her, she would smile. The family remembers that when Peggy was 10 months old, they traveled, the, the parents traveled for about a week. And when they came back, Peggy wasn't looking at them. She wasn't holding her arms up to, to greet them. And the mom realized that even though Peggy seemed to be in generally good health, something was missing. When she was 14 months old, she began to walk, but she would frequently run into the corner of the kitchen table. Peggy ran into all different kinds of things, and the parents became concerned that something could be wrong with her vision. So they took her to an ophthalmologist, and Peggy was diagnosed with optic atrophy. But it took several additional years for the full clinical picture to emerge. Peggy did not only have optic atrophy. There were developmental delays, and she had cognitive problems that made it difficult for her to learn and to use the newly acquired knowledge in everyday life. An IQ test later would show that Peggy falls into the mild to moderate intellectual disability range. Peggy's behaviors were also unusual. Peggy needs a lot of repetition, and she enjoys a lot of repetition. There's a lot of obsessive compulsive behaviors, and she was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. But despite all the challenges, all the difficulties, and the medical problems, there are also strengths and specific skill sets that Peggy has. For example, she learned to speak fluently in two languages, Arabic and French. And there's one particular skill that her mom told me right at the very first time that we met, long-term memory. To be honest, at that time I felt, well, you know, how, how good could it really be? But Peggy showed me and she surprised me. Take birthdays, for example. Peggy remembers them all. The very first time Peggy meets you, she will ask you for your birthday and she will never have to ask again. She remembers them all. But what makes Peggy a patient number one? Peggy was that patient who led us to a new disease gene discovery. She was the first individual to be affected with a condition that was previously not known to exist. Was Peggy the first patient ever to be born with that condition? Well, obviously not. But she and the workup that we did on her led us to discover something new, a new genetic disorder. And so Peggy became the key to solving her own medical mystery. Yet again, how do we identify these patients number one? What makes them stand out? I mean, we see a lot of patients in clinic. 
Some of them can be diagnosed quite easily because they have features that are so typical that we recognize them and that we can make the diagnosis purely on clinical grounds. Then again, there's a large number of patients that are not quite as straightforward, but with the tools of molecular genetic testing that we have available today, we can get to a diagnosis. And then there's still a large number of patients who remain undiagnosed. Even in 2018, with all the technology that we have available, we sequencing exomes and genomes, still about 50% of the patients who walk through our clinic door will remain without a diagnosis. There's so many patients, male and female, young and old, straightforward and complex, familial and isolated, but how do we find that patient number one? I mean, very rarely do they reveal themselves. But there's something about them. You know, oftentimes they kind of stand out. They don't quite fit. They don't fit the pattern. And you could say that Peggy was one of those patients because even if you took 100 patients with optic atrophy, Peggy stood out. It was the unique combination of optic atrophy plus intellectual disability with obsessive compulsive disorder and autism spectrum disorder that made her stand out of that crowd. She was unique. And it's those unique cases that have the potential of being a case number one. Sometimes those are the uncomfortable cases. They can make you feel uncomfortable because you don't have the answers ready for that family. And obviously, they're uncomfortable to the family as well because they've been looking for answers for many years. But those are the cases worth investing, worth investing extra time, going the extra mile, reading the expanded report of that exome sequencing uh, report, and to look at the genes that are not yet known to be human disease genes. So in a perfect situation, you know, I'm talking about rare clinical findings here or unusual constellations of clinical features. And if you're lucky, that rare clinical phenotype will correlate with a rare genotype. Obviously, I'm talking about the low-hanging fruit here, right? I'm talking about rare variants that are not present in control cohorts. I'm talking about de novo variants. I'm talking about loss of function variants. At some point, that pool of low-hanging fruit will be depleted. At some point, we'll have to start thinking about unusual inheritance patterns, about imprinted genes, about variants in regulatory regions, about variants in non-coding RNA, etc. But believe me, there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit out there and the days of Mendelian genomics and genetics are not quite over yet. So back to Peggy. In Peggy's case, we did trio whole exome sequencing, and we identified a variant, a missense variant, in the NR2F1 gene. This was a variant in a highly conserved region of the gene, and it was also in a functionally very relevant domain of the protein. The DNA binding domain of this protein which functions as a transcription factor. Even more importantly, there was already knowledge about that protein in neurodevelopment and we knew that this protein was important for the development of the eye and more importantly even for the development of the optic nerve. So we felt that we were on the right path at this point, all we had to do was to identify more patients. And so more patients were identified. We were very lucky to be connected with the group, the awesome group of uh, human genetics in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And as always in medicine and in science, it is so much better to work together rather than to compete against one another. 
And so we collaborated with a group in Nijmegen and that resulted in the first publication at the end of 2013 about individuals with mutations in the NR2F1 gene. Six individuals, all with vision impairment due to abnormalities of the optic nerve, all with intellectual disability plus additional neurological features. And the condition caused by NR2F1 mutations was then later named by OMIM Bosch Bonstra Schaaf Optic Atrophy Syndrome. Over the past five years, we've come a long way and we've come to understand a lot about this condition. We've identified many additional patients. We've come to really appreciate the full phenotypic spectrum, and we now know that there are genotype-phenotype correlations, such that mutations in the DNA binding domain of this gene have the most severe phenotypic effects. That is because the NR2F1 protein functions as a homodimer, so mutations in the DNA binding domain exhibit a dominant negative effect and affect the function even of the wild-type protein and those will be the patients with the most severe clinical features. So, you see, we've learned a lot from these patients, and in particular, we've learned a lot from Peggy. Remember how I told you about her unusual long-term memory. We've come to realize that this is not unique about Peggy, but this is actually a feature that we see in a lot of patients with NR2F1 mutations. And we've been able to study the persistence of memory using a mouse model. These are heterozygous NR2F1 knockout mice. And on the left-hand side, you can see the results of conditioned fear testing. In this kind of setup, the mice are placed into a chamber on day zero, which you do not see on the slide, and they receive an electric foot shock. On day one, two, three, and four, they brought back into that chamber without getting any additional foot shock, but they will still remember what happened on day zero. And they will respond with anxiety. And the anxiety will manifest as freezing, so they don't move. And the freezing can be quantified and is shown on this slide here. In a normal mouse, because there are no additional foot shocks on subsequent days, the mouse will forget about what happened on day one. But as you see, the heterozygous knockout mice shown in red here, they remember longer. That memory sticks with them. And that correlates with electrophysiological changes that can be measured as LTDs and LTPs, long-term potentiation and long-term depression in the hippocampus of those mice. There's so much we can learn from our patients. We just need to listen to their stories. Listen to their parents, because nobody knows these children better than the parents do. Ask open-ended questions, and you will start to discover things that you did not expect. You may ask, why me? I mean, why would I make a new disease gene discovery? I'm just a regular clinical geneticist, and what can I do? You know, this is the beauty of human genetics. We get to see those medical mystery cases. We get to see those patients who have traveled a long way, who've been seen by many other specialties who weren't able to solve that case. That is a gift and a wonderful opportunity. And if you think that the days of disease gene discoveries are over because all the disease gene discoveries have already been made, you're obviously wrong. You can see on this slide here, provided by OMIM, how far we have come and how many discoveries have been made over the past years. But there's still a lot, there are still thousands of genes not yet known to be associated with human, dece uh, with human disease. Despite all the progress that we have made, there's lots, lots to be discovered. So look at the expanded reports and look at those genes not yet known to be associated with human disease. And if you are a medical student in the room or listening online, I really want you to listen. This is the fascination of medical genetics. 
This is something that very few other disciplines have to offer. We are the bridge between basic sciences and clinical care. And ideally, we get to go from the bedside to the bench and back to the bedside. Consider medical genetics as a career. We from the American College of Medical Genetics will be more than happy to answer your questions and tell you all about the wonderful things that our discipline has to offer. But I have to include a warning. <laughs> and this warning goes out to our hospital systems, to our billing departments, and to the CEOs of our hospitals. We will only continue to do the extraordinary if we not considered to be workhorses that are judged by the number of work are reused that we generate. Extraordinary care of medical mystery cases takes time. There has been a trend in our clinics that we are asked to see more and more patients that the time that we allowed per patient is decreased. But a thorough clinical history, a good physical examination and a comprehensive review of those medical mystery cases takes time. We are not general practitioners and we owe our patients the time to listen to their stories. So I want to encourage you to go out and treat every single patient you see as if they had the potential to become your next patient number one. I promise you it will be an amazing experience. It will be a gift to your patients because you will become better at solving their medical mysteries and at providing them with the answers that they've been looking for for so long. And it will be a gift to you because you will get to learn and discover. So what's new with Peggy? In two weeks, Peggy will be traveling from Lebanon to Houston again. And she will be our superstar at the first international family conference for bosch bunstra scharf optic atrophy syndrome. We're having more than 100 individuals from all over the world attend this conference, and I know already that they will have an amazing experience. They will get to meet a family they didn't even know it existed. They will get to meet people who have been traveling on the same path who've had similar experiences, who have the same concerns and worries, the same fears, but also share the same dreams and hopes for the future. That is the beauty of stories that start with the patient number one. We will always remember where they started, and this particular story will always be linked to Peggy and her story. But we can't possibly predict where these stories will take us. There will be enormous insight and many, many discoveries to be made. There's still so much to be discovered. So go out and find your next patient number one. Thank you.